And what we found is that copyright is a rather, it's a blunt tool that, you know, often leads to either black and white or, you know, all or nothing solutions. And that is dangerous because it can threaten this, this intrinsic balance that is so important to keep copyright um, in, in place. Hello, and welcome to this podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Brigitte Vezina. Brigitte is Director of Policy and Open Culture at Creative Commons, and her bio states that she gets a kick out of tackling the fuzzy legal and policy issues that stand in the way of access, use, reuse, and remix of culture information and knowledge. Before joining Creative Commons, she worked for a decade as a legal officer at WIPO and then ran her own consultancy. So, Brigitte, Creative Commons have written a lot about the implications of artificial intelligence, AI, for the past months, uh, as have many others. <laughs> and I actually had a difficult time identifying one single article to highlight for this podcast because the sum of the articles is so useful as a whole. It paints a picture to a certain extent. Could you outline in less than five minutes what the key thoughts are so far from your side, especially in light of developments such as the AI Act in the European Union? Yeah, uh, so yeah, there's a lot going on. Uh, um, AI, as you know, is evolving really fast and we need to adapt our, our thinking and our actions to all these rapid developments in technology, but also as a global organization at Creative Commons, we need to be mindful of many different contexts. And, um, you know, that might be the reason or part of the reason why it's so hard to summarize all our views, all our thoughts in in, uh, in one blog post. But um, I'll try to do my best to give you um, kind of snapshots of where our, um, our current thinking is uh, at the moment. So our thinking is actually informed by wide-ranging consultations. So we've been driving them since February this year. Um, we call it a loud listening exercise to kind of figure out what should be done. So we've engaged with uh, creators, technologists, policymakers, all sorts of uh, stakeholders to consider how we can best, um, I guess, maximize the public benefit of AI. So, And also at the same time, I guess, address the concerns about how AI systems are trained and used, and specifically from Creative Commons, how that will affect the commons. Um, so what I can tell you is that there are a wide variety of views. From all these consultations, we've heard from creators that are very much concerned about AI, and they perceive it as a serious threat to their livelihood. Um, at the same time, there are many artists that are relishing the new possibilities offered by AI. Um, they see it as a way to push the boundaries of um, human creative expression and as a way to make creativity like more accessible, uh, for example, for people with disabilities. Um, we've also heard from developers that want you know, unbridled freedom. They want to go ahead and build their models. Uh, but other developers are uh, willing to work with opt-outs. So, you know, they want to respect the wishes of people who do not want to have their content trained upon or they want to train on specifically openly licensed content. So, yeah, we, we see all, all these views being expressed and we listen to them. And so our aim is really to strive to reconcile those views as much as possible. Um, our, our ultimate aim is really to empower creators with choices uh, so that they can choose how they can support a thriving commons that we can all enjoy. And we want to promote better sharing. So I don't know if you're uh, familiar with this um, this notion that is really the, the core of our new uh, strategic ambition. So better sharing, so sharing that is um, inclusive, that is equitable, that is reciprocal. So to me, this notion of reciprocity really becomes fundamental in the age of AI. Uh, sharing that is sustainable, so both financially and environmentally. So it's not sharing just for the sh sake of sharing, but it's sharing as a means to achieve a variety of public interest goals, like access to education, um, scientific progress, um, yeah, enjoyment of culture, creativity for all. So I guess 
how do we make sure that there is this better sharing in the field of AI? Well, our basic assumption is that all creativity builds on the past. And I think we, we agree on this. Um, we all are influenced by, by those who came before. So it's important that the laws like copyright continue to leave room for people to to study, to analyze, and to learn from previous works to create new ones. And inclu that includes, you know, analyzing past works using automated means. So um, the message that we've been sharing with policymakers is that when it comes to shaping copyright, um, as in any uh, area of intervention, balance is key. And so there needs to be appropriate limits on copyright protection if we want the copyright system to fulfill its function of both incentivizing creativity and providing access to knowledge. And uh, in our view, that is the current framework in the EU with um, the DSM directive, so the, um, the 2009 directive on copyright in the digital single market, and particularly articles three and four on text and data mining. So um, for those of you who don't know about these articles in detail, uh, Article 3 allows for de text and data mining for scientific research by research and cultural institutions. And Article 4 is a more general exception for anyone, for any purpose, but it has a kind of built-in opt-out mechanism where right holders can reserve their rights uh, and then uh, prevent text and data mining if they have expressly reserved their right. And so to us, this setup could strike the right balance between AI innovation and creator empowerment by giving creators the freedom to choose how they want to share in the ecosystem. And I guess it's also important to realize that it's not all or nothing. So we have to recognize that some models may be infringing, uh, that some uses may certainly be infringing. And so our aim should be to develop um, norms and practices that are flexible, that are adaptable. So, you know, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. So um, we're already seeing some mechanisms that are being developed to achieve this at scale. Um, I don't know if you know about spawning AI, but there are efforts like this uh, that really try to help creators to signal their preference. So creators are empowered to show and and uh, express their wish, uh, whether they want their works to be used to train uh, models or not. So um, generally speaking, we really welcome the EU's leadership on defining a regulatory framework around AI, and we support the AI's overall approach, but we need to avoid creating rules, which, you know, although they're well-intentioned, they could undermine better sharing. So we're working on language that will help promote innovation and increase transparency and empower those creators that wish to opt out to do so in an operational and standardized way. And it seems that at this point, uh, these approaches uh, could work well to serve a thriving commons and achieve a better sharing of knowledge and culture. Okay. Um... <laughs> I, I had a small smile when you said something that works and functions and is efficient, and I thought oh, that would be a novelty in Brussels. <laughs> but but I, I appreciate the fact that, um, to a certain extent, you ran your own consultation in parallel to the consultations that policymakers did, and that you know the the, the your thoughts are the reflection of all yeah. of the views that that you received. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you highlighted in one uh, of the blog posts I read, which I thought was interesting because it was um, specific and I hadn't spotted it anywhere else, which is the link that exists between AI and free and open source software or, or FOSS. Uh, and, and you kind of highlighted in that blog post the opportunities, but also some of the threats that maybe um, the AI Act could bring to FOSS because of you know, vague or imprecise or confusing language. Can, can you explain that? Um, so to take a step back, we need to remind ourselves that FOSS plays an essential role in the AI ecosystem. It really brings important benefits that are unique to FOSS. 
So, um, for example, it can improve transparency and auditability of AI systems. So, in other words, you know, the fact that they're open and accessible, um, that you can share the software, the data sets and the models, all to make up this AI ecosystem, um, you know, it allows a lot more scrutiny and understanding of both their capacities, their cap capabilities, and their shortcomings. Um, it makes it also a lot easier for many players, um, many different players like nonprofits and startups and SMEs to enter, to innovate and compete in the market. So it really can en enable competition and innovation by new entrants and smaller players. And that is vital to the EU if we want to sustain innovation. And I guess lastly, FOSS also helps build a more dynamic and inclusive landscape. It can show that you know, smaller models can be highly effective. And you know, they, they're easier to experiment with, they can diversify control. And I think very uniquely, they provide incentives that are not profit motivated. motivated. So it's really important that they form part of the AI ecosystem. So the AI Act, I think, is going in the right direction, but, and it's a big but, it's, uh, it can certainly do better at supporting open source software. The issue is that current proposals, they really threaten to create impractical barriers, um, disadvantages for uh, contributors to the open ecosystem. So to give you an example, the text, as it currently reads, it could impede simply just making open source components available in public repositories or collaborating on them. And that is the very process on which open source develops. It depends on this um, the sharing and collaboration. So if that is prevented, it becomes impossible to develop uh, open source uh, systems. So to be clear, um, we're not saying that, you know, open approaches to AI development should be fully exempt from the AI's I, the AI Act's requirements. And I guess we recognize that open source AI can also, it can also make harmful uses of AI more accessible to more people. Um, some of these models might be biased or wrong or, you know, they can be used to generate disinformation or even lead to abuse. So we're very aware of that. But it's critical that these well-intentioned proposals in the act that they do not have unintended harmful consequences for open source software development. So <clears throat> we need to make sure that if we want to control FOSS in the AI space, we need to, you know, look at things from a different angle and, um, and really take a different approach. Um, than the one that we're used to to regulate the larger players. So <clears throat> we're looking at a more tailored and more proportionate approach that will recognize that this form of development is dif it differs from proprietary approaches. And it's not only different, but it's necessary if we want to sustain a dynamic and competitive market. So <clears throat> we, we think the AI Act should do, and there are many things, but I'll highlight two here is that it should ensure that the research and development exception is practical and effective so that it it permits you know limited testing in real world conditions which is the only way that we can see if the, the software uh, works and it should also set proportional requirements for these quote unquote foundation models it should recognize and really treat differently these different uses and these different development modalities, including open source approaches. So that's our view on this so far. So basically try to avoid the, the usual trap, which is when policymakers regulate thinking about a couple of big companies and trying to curb what those companies are doing, but forgetting that often the innovation comes from the smaller contenders exactly. and you need to give them the room to uh, be able to innovate. Exactly. Um, another element that I spotted in, 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 in Creative Commons' blog post series on AI is that 
you see that the AI Act is, you know, and you mentioned it, there are copyright copyright rules or at least copyright references creeping into the language uh, of the AI Act, uh, more specifically from the European Parliament side. And they they seem to come at it from two angles, uh, an angle from tr uh, a transparency angle, let's say. So basically knowing what is copyrighted in the data sets that are used for training. Um, and another angle, which is more of a content moderation angle, or at least a possibility of content moderation being imposed, let's say, on uh, AI models. Do you think that is a necessary thing? And I know you mentioned TDM uh, previously, but you know, looking specifically at that transparency and that content moderation, what do you see as potential issues? Well, first, you're right to point out that the copyright relationship to AI was really not core to the initial proposal. Uh, it crept in. <laughs> uh, that all changed at the 11th hour uh, with the introduction of uh, Article 28B, Paragraph 4. Um, it looks like this provision is here to stay. Uh, I don't think it's going to be taken out of the Act. So, um, yeah, it's important that we, we take a closer look at it. Um, first, I guess, regarding transparency and that provision, um, I want to say that we we fully support transparency in principle. So uh, in our view, it's really in the public interest to have general transparency obligation because that will help build trust. It will help build understanding of AI system. And hopefully it will you know foster wider adoption for the common good. But as currently worded, um, that obligation, so under its paragraph C, so 28D4C, uh, to, uh, I, and I quote, document and make publicly available a sufficiently detailed summary of the use of training data protected under copyright is ambig ambiguous. And um, we will need to interpret that in a way that is practical. So in other words, we need to find a way to achieve the AI acts um, aim to really increase trans transparency, but without placing an undue and an unreasonable burden on AI developers. So will a simple reference to a data set be sufficient? Maybe, I will probably need to, uh, to follow the Trilog discussions to, to find more. Um, from CC's perspective, generally, we think that this obligation should not be limited to copyright works. So it should extend to all training materials, again, because we see transparency as core to building trustworthy systems. Um, and then regarding your second point, which is the quote unquote con content moderation that's in paragraph B, so 28B4B. <laughs> uh, so we're still analyzing the language. Um, we're thinking about how, you know, this the gen generation of illegal content, it's not worded as such, but um, that's, that's the idea. Uh, we're, we're still thinking about how to, that will be interpreted again and whether that will cover copyright infringement. Uh, and if so, well, how will, you know, the balancing mechanisms of copyright, either external or internal to copyright law, how these mechanisms are going to play out? Because we need to ensure that user rights are respected. So we can look back to Article 17 of the DSM, you know, the upload filters provision that provides ample um, you know, valuable lessons in that context. Um, because we, we've seen that if we are going to have safeguards in place to filter, quote unquote, you know, the potentially copyright infringing content, well, those safeguards. Oh, and, and these safeguards really should include um, human oversight because, as we know, filters are notoriously bad at identifying perfectly legal uses like parody or pastiche or even use of CC license content. So what we're saying is that we really need to ensure that um, if there are uses that are based on freedom of expression or other kinds of uses that are legitimate, they need to be permitted. And those safeguards need to leave room for, for that. Um, and if we wanna go one step further, so if AI were to generate potentially infringing content, 
Well, we would need to rely on copyright standard analysis, and that is, you know, substantial similarity between the two works at stake. And here we need to be very discerning about what is unprotectable content, right? What are the facts? What are the ideas? What are the, what they call sans affaire, you know, these kind of garden variety or like commonplace elements, all these things that may be part of content, but are non protectable under copyright and that they need to be excluded from the comparative analysis between the two works. So it's really early to tell. And I guess over time and with more uh, cases being assessed, we'll have more clarity on how copyright applies. Uh, to, you know, potentially infringing outputs. What's certain is that the courts will need to balance the interests of right holders with those of users because we need to protect these legitimate uses. So private uses, quote unquote, transformative uses, and ensure that they are legally allowed under exceptions. So that's, that's the copyright um, infringement or infringing aspect of it. Creative Commons has also looked at the copyright um, output, <laughs> let's say, aspect of, of, of AI. So AI creates something. Is that something copyrightable or should it fall under copyright? And Creative Commons has always clearly stated that using copyright to govern AI is not the wisest thing to do, maybe, and it is contradictory to copyright's primordial, primordial function uh, of offering uh, an environment that enables human creativity, that allows human creativity to flourish. C can you maybe clarify? Because I think a lot of people have forgotten what the purpose of copyright is or is supposed to be. So can you maybe clarify that with that AI perspective? Sure. So maybe I'll take the first part of your question first, which is about the outputs. Um, and then we can move as to, you know, whether copyright is the right answer in the first place. Um, but yeah, for uh, AI generated content, um, Creative Commons views is that there could be copyright protection over that content, provided there is sufficient human creative input. So if it's fully automated, and we haven't really seen that yet, but if it's, you know, there's very kind of insignificant uh, human input and it's the machine that creates on its own, there should not be any protection. But if we start looking at how artists are actually using AI, they're using it as a tool and it's a tool to assist them, to support them, to, you know, enhance their own creativity. It's not, uh, yeah, we shouldn't see it as something that will replicate or undermine or replace them. So, We've seen examples, um, I've heard from the, the gaming industry, how it can really enhance the player's experience, um, you know, with, uh, with AI being used to kind of generate new experiences as, as gamers uh, progress through their games in an adaptive way. So um, we can see that there is a lot of potential to enhance um, the creative experience, both for artists and for people who will be engaging and enjoying the creations. Um, but I guess, yeah, we, we will need to draw a line um, between what's what's going to be uh, considered protectable and what uh, will be in the public domain. Um, so, yeah, we, we just need to, um, I guess, look back to existing copyright protectability criteria and determine whether something is original. That's the threshold in copyright. Um, as I said, using AI as a tool that supports human creativity, because that is the, the underlying objective of copyright. Um, it's, it's, it's really its core purpose is to incentivize human creativity. So that's why we think that like originality, human authorship, that really has to remain essential to granting copyright over, um, over content. Um, and like I said, anything that's automa autom autonomously, sorry, generated uh, should not, in and that does not involve uh, significant human creativity, is just not in copyright scope. Um, but yeah, to go back to the second part of your question, um, just last week, 
I, I was in London where we hosted uh, some of our roundtables. So to, to really uh, gather more views from our community. So we, um, we listened to members of our communities there. And what we've heard there, and I guess time and again through our, um, our consultations, is that copyright is really just one lens through which we can consider AI. And often copyright is not the right tool to regulate it. Um, we realized this, and, and, and I guess that dates to, you know, even our earlier thinking on AI is that beyond copyright, there are several obstacles to sharing and using content, and those are related to ethics, to privacy and data protection, and many other super valid and extremely serious concerns. And what we found is that copyright is a rather, it's a blunt tool that you know often leads to either black and white or you know all or nothing solutions and that is dangerous because it can threaten this this intrinsic balance that is so important to keep copyright um in in place so um to address these concerns several other legal regimes are better suited so um, i mentioned privacy but safety and transparency like we discussed a few minutes ago and that is actually already included in the AI Act. So we think that it's a really good approach to not just throw everything into the copyright bucket. Um, we're also seeing that there are norms and standards that are emerging outside of copyright, you know, just through community practice. Uh, we're seeing opt-outs. I mentioned spawning AI uh, before. Uh, we are also seeing developments in openly licensed data sets for training. I, I mentioned that some developers want to train their models on specifically openly licensed content. And at this point in time, it seems that those approaches will serve to, you know, serve a thriving commons. So I guess from CC's perspective, it's clear that we need a diverse community of people to be involved in guiding regulation of generative AI. So we need people with expertise in copyright, certainly, but also in ethics and in privacy and fundamental rights. Um, yeah, we need this diversity because I, like, I don't think we can gloss over the fact that all the major AI companies are all led by men. So we also need to bridge that gender gap. Um, and so it's important to you know, help raise those voices that have not been centered so far so that we can consider this broad range of perspectives and all of these experiences moving forward. Um, just a few maybe last, last thoughts. Um, I guess we want to be optimistic about AI's promises for creators, for uh, our large community of people who want to contribute to enriching a commons that truly reflects the diversity of creative expression. Um, you may have heard about the voluntary commitments that were just secured by the Biden-Harris administration in the U.S. Um, yeah, government got together with the main AI companies to try to manage the risks that are posed by AI. But here in the EU, there will be actual rules, not you know voluntary commitments, which are much softer, which can you know be easily put aside especially when these companies are driven by profit and don't really have the public interest uh, in mind. So that's what we're doing at CC. So that will be my, my concluding thoughts. So we're really putting the public interest front and center in our reflections on AI. And this is all about better sharing. And this is our lens as how we think that, you know, these are the best ways to shape the right environment for AI to flourish. It's in, in alignment with our mission and, you know, you know, we're an organization that offers licenses that are built on top of copyright, but we also know that copyright is not necessarily the answer to every question. So thank you, Brigitte. That was really helpful. I guess the message is uh, better sharing for public interest caring <laughs> to kind <laughs> of change the old uh, sharing is caring uh, meme. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll be discussing the AI Act for some months uh, to come. And we're certainly grateful that Creative Commons is bringing that public interest and that balanced view into the mix because balance is not what Brussels is best at usually. Uh, and hopefully policymakers will take notice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.